my family used to go camping with a few groups of friends when I was a kid. A bunch of us would get together, plan a weekend, and then caravan out into the middle of nowhere together. This allowed kids whose parents weren't able to make it because there were so many adults in attendance. It was like a self-generated summer camp type of setting. We were always safe, well provided for, and having monumental fun out in the bush. I remember one Christmas when I was about five. We were camping out in the bush. I'd been on several trips by then and felt keen on all the festivities. I considered myself a veteran of the outback. Dad let me start my own small fire, roast my own food, even pick my own bedtime. These camping trips were very special memories for all of us. We grew into ourselves without the bustle of the cityscape back home. For those who don't know, the bush is some of the harshest, most isolated terrain in the world. It's unforgiving backcountry, arid, and undeveloped scrubland. It's hot, waterless, and everything is prepared to kill you, even the plants and the prey. We didn't worry about that though. Our parents brokered the camping so we never dealt with anything dangerous. They weren't survival experts, but they knew the ins and the outs of being isolated. Very few trips ever resulted in mishaps or any injuries. There were nine kids in total in our campsite. We weren't allowed to wander through the bush. Parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp. We never wandered far, but this was definitely my favorite part of the entire trip. It felt like we were part of a special operations team or on some kind of mission through the Badlands. Others would gather the rest of our tools, hand shovels, compasses, a small tarp for cover. We weren't touring the camping spot. We were in another world in our heads. I imagine we looked pretty outfitted as we roamed around, despite being so tiny. Between the nine of us, the oldest was probably eight years old. It was imagination at its finest, and our parents would only fan the flames. They'd periodically come over the walkie-talkie, pretending to be base camp or the rescue chopper, whatever fit the game that we were playing. I don't remember what game was that day, but we hadn't made contact with the parents in quite a while. We'd actually gone a little further than normal, were feeling cheeky when the walkie-talkie started to crackle. We all gathered around and waited for the message. Slowly, someone began speaking to us through the speaker, writhed in static. It was a man's voice. He said that he was Santa, and he was trying to find us to give us our presents. We asked him where he was and how we could find him. We're all bug-eyed, staring at the radio between us. It made sense to our little brains. Of course, Santa was on across the radio waves. He traveled the whole world. He needed comm links to make a journey like that. I'm out here and I, I know I'm close to you, he said. I can hear all of you, not far off. Why don't you just keep going north until you see me? We looked down at our equipment. Despite our lack of outdoor skills, we actually had the compass and we knew which way that was. Again, this was the furthest out we'd ever been, so we decided to make contact with the grown-ups first. Surely, they'd want to come along and meet Santa too. Thinking back, I wonder if we collectively kind of knew this was too good to be true. Either way, we were excited. We all ran back to our campsite, screaming that we just made contact with Santa. The parents laughed at us as he crowded back into the camp, but we didn't let up. We were adamant that Santa had just come over the walkie-talkie. He wanted us to come and find him. Some of the parents settled us down and questioned us directly and specifically. Who contacted who over the radio? What exactly did he say? Did you tell him where you're staying? Your name? Where you live? How long did he talk to you for? They went on and on, and we excitedly, almost annoyed, answered all the questions. Didn't they understand? Santa Claus was waiting somewhere, just through the scrub brush. They told us what was really going on. That wasn't Santa. It was some outback dwelling weirdo who was probably within a mile or two. We only partly understood what they were saying. It was nuanced because they had to keep the illusion of Santa being real in place while still explaining that the voice we heard was a dangerous stranger who wanted to lure us into the wilderness. The walkie-talkie was taken off of us, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of that trip. We were all pretty devastated at the time. But I understand the seriousness of it, and the creepiness of it, now looking back as an adult. 
I remember overhearing them talk about it later that night. They honestly didn't know what to make of all of it. It could have been another camper just having some honest fun with some kids over the radio. The reality was they didn't know and couldn't risk finding that out. We changed camping locations after that trip for obvious reasons. What really shook them up was that they didn't even hear the guy. We were all tagged to do the same frequency. So when his voice came out over our speaker, it should have come out over the adult speaker too, but it didn't. Somehow that guy spoke directly to us and only us and invited us to come find out why. I've spent countless hours inside the deep woods. I've seen a lot of weird, semi-spooky stuff, but it usually has a pretty round and reasoned truth behind it. I've heard even stranger stuff, stuff I thought people just made up for clout. I don't entertain a lot of what I would consider nonsense. This is the only time, the only few seconds, that goes down as truly inexplicable for me. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. It's a strenuous hobby that not everybody understands, but those that do get the commitment. Get to see views and terrain not many do. Get to breathe air untouched by industry. Get to swim in waters people aren't constantly pissing in. It also stands as some of the best full body exercise a person can do. Did I mention it's therapeutic? But I digress. Sometimes though, Walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp, it's spooky. Hands free just in case something comes barreling out of the darkness trying to rip my face off. I don't believe in the paranormal, but bears and cougars are real life predators. On deep hikes, creatures like these are much nearer to us than we know. In the dark with the headlamp, every odd scratch or rustle in the underbrush feels like a certain death. It's the only part of distance hiking that makes me anxious, but still, it's part of the hobby. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles in trail, riverbank, lakeshore, ridge, bottoms, bogs, and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important you understand. I've heard, seen, and smelt all about this region that it has to offer in way of wilderness. That woodland was my house and I knew every room and railing. My scariest experience happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was a late spring in the same woodland, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five, barely breaking a sweat. I'm waiting to hit caffeine so I don't burn out too early in my journey. There's a chill blanketing the whole forest. That wet, almost misty kind of spring morning. Definitely common for the area that I'm in. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed by a thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Exercise is the goal when it's dark, as there definitely isn't anything to look at. I just stay focused and make sure I don't blow out a knee or get bit by something. Then, I hear a loud crack. I froze solid. It was a crazy sound to hear five, six miles into the wilderness in the still ripening dawn. It was something I, for the first time in a long time, have never heard before. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 a.m. in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Even the nocturnal animals are getting ready to go to sleep making for a weird overlap out there where nothing stirs at all. It's a supreme silence, and usually when hunters tend to do their stalking, it's the best time to get into position while everything is resting before sunrise. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as soon as I stood there balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around going all the way back I came in a hurry. That was the only logical option out there. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. 
it wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure that I heard something intentional. Hearing it twice, well, that meant get out of here. That meant something territorial to me. Like a snake shaking its rattle, letting you know it's time to fuck off. I wasn't in a position to try and route myself around something that didn't want me out there. I had a headlamp strapped to my head that gave my position to whoever was out there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo sized bat stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump, and I have described it as explosive in the past because it was so sudden and so terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon to be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from. I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was gonna come to a 180 degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant, as soon as I got the courage to move toward that noise, I was gonna have to turn my back to it to get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between meth fiend murderer and some kind of animal pulling my guts out of my ass. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got 20 to 30 minutes until first light. I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep the 180 turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. It didn't help. In fact, it made me hesitate with each step because I keep thinking there was something lurking just before me. Again, I'm just trying to get through until the sun comes up and levels the playing field. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet still, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen while humping it up the trail. It is a delicate thing to try to carry a substantial amount of hiking gear while trying to not make any sounds. For a lot of people, it's impossible, but it can be done. When you find yourself out there enough, some situations demand it. That's when I smell it. I stop in my tracks and take it in. A stench hits me that I cannot describe. I just imagine wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days of old decomposition, but it just smelled strange, unplaceable. And being so far removed from civilization, it really limited the options. There wasn't even trash or sewage out here. There wasn't a burn pit. I kept walking fast. By the time I made it to the top of that ridge, I was huffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were now chirping. Once the sun was up, I no longer cared about being quiet. Whatever was out there could see me the whole time. It chose to leave me alone. I've heard it all in the woods, I've smelled it all, and I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many, many times. I don't know. I kept on. I finished my hike that day. Never encountered anything that forced me to turn around. It's just a weird time in a weird place when I heard that weird noise. And to this day, nothing like that has ever happened in that area again. I was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. I was alone, roughly eight miles from the nearest recreational area. I like to hike off trail and see the sights, discover little ponds and stuff like that. On this day, I discovered a campsite where something very, very bad had taken place. A person with zero hiking, camping, or any other experience had gotten themselves into trouble, big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The place is absolutely annihilated, like a tornado touchdown, picked up the whole place and then slammed it back down. Trash everywhere, clothes shredded to ribbons, the tent chewed to strips of polyester. It smelled like death and septic, like rotten human waste throughout the whole area. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness, 
until I noticed the desperate looking human figure, covered in blood, whimpering quietly under a tree by the tent. They were riddled with open wounds of varying severity. I could see flesh and meat hanging out of some of the deeper lacerations. They weren't festering, but they weren't pouring blood either. Whatever happened had taken place a while ago. The person had gone to the bathroom all over themselves. The smell in the air was starting to come together. This person had been lying there for a long time. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to hip, single punctures up and down his back, and his hands and forearms full of what looked like to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was well before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked inside those mountains. Thankfully, there was a road very close by, kinda, less than two miles, but when you're walking through the brush, it isn't exactly speedy. I busted through as quick as I could while trying to piece it all together. I wish I'd examined the campsite a little better. Was he out there alone? Did he have a disagreement with someone while he was camping and it turned fatal? Did some stranger do this? I didn't know what to think. Animals are always a possibility, but why didn't they finish the job? I got to the road and didn't know which way to go. There wasn't any community to walk to. Simply looking for other people to get help. I started going north and fortunately, I was able to flag someone down. A couple of guys bumping around in an old jeep. I explained what I came upon as best I could, and I must have done a good job because their faces lost more and more color the longer I talked. They agreed to help and took off down the road. They said they'd get authorities and lead them back to this exact spot that I met them on the road. It was the quickest way to meet back up again. The whole rescue operation was like a baton race because everyone had the location of the next person, but no one single person actually knew the entire route. The guys in the jeep knew how to get to town, and they would know how to get back to me, and I would lead them to the bloodbath. There was only one thing to do. I waited for assistance to arrive. It took them about an hour until they came rumbling up the mountain, and I led them to the still unidentified individual. He was not very conversant when I helped him out. I was actually pretty sure he'd be dead before we arrived. I mean, sitting there for an hour, it's not hard to arrive at some grim conclusions. That guy was clearly close to death. Even if we got there in time, infection could take him out at any point after retrieval. It took another hour to get the emergency responders back into the canyon. I assisted them in bringing him out. Once we got him on the stretcher, I could see his wounds were far worse than I'd realized. Every inch of him was crushed and sliced up in every direction. Fat and muscle hung out of him and off the stretcher during those steep declines. The guy was in and out of consciousness the whole time, and rightfully so. I couldn't imagine the pain this guy endured for days on end. We huffed him up the last ridge, loaded him into the response vehicle. The sheriff and forest rangers asked if I wanted to lift back, and so I took them up on their offer, headed back into town, and got myself cleaned up. The whole day turned into be much more than just a distance hike, but a life or death mission for a stranger we all didn't know. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call me and let me know what was up with the person that we helped out. A buddy of mine came and picked me up, then gave me a lift out to the trailhead where I'd left my truck. I told him the details as we drove, shaking the entire drive. We made it. I collected my rig and made the trip back home. I got home from work three days later. There was a message on my machine. It was the sheriff's department. The story was, the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep his food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, not high enough. The night before I happened upon that site, a bear had used the tent and its occupant in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. Dude survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods ever again.
This happened to me and some friends of mine in Sydney, Australia. When we wanted to go underage drinking, we would buy a case of beer or a bottle of spirit and hike about four kilometers into the bush to the middle of nowhere to drink without worrying about getting in trouble. We would pass out in a sleeping bag under the stars in the summer and be just fine. This is the quintessential Outback shenanigans. Dirt dwelling with a bottle of alcohol and your best asshole friends around you. At the end of the day though, it's harmless. We aren't trying to get up into any trouble, cause damage, or even bother anybody. It's a rite of passage, how we grow up into who we're supposed to be. I'm sure your country and culture has a similar pastime for the youth. What happened to us though, is a bit more out of the ordinary. So one afternoon my friends decide it's a camping night and head off with beer to the usual spot we'd use. We all just collectively agreed, packed, and then piled into the youths for the journey. It was impromptu, really no planning, and that means none of us checked the weather. This was a big no-no, as we really knew better, and had gotten into hairy situations before because of storms and the like. And of course, the forecast was for dangerous storms up and down that entire area. The forecast was for later in the evening, so as we drove, there wasn't a cloud in sight. Getting rained out wasn't on our radar even the slightest, and the delayed thunderheads was a perfect lure for us. So we get out there, set up a meager camp, and let the party rage into the evening. Some of us are dancing, some of us are talking, but all of us are hammered. It's what we came here to do, and honestly, we're really good at it. Too good. None of us noticed the buildup above us, and a slight rumbling in the distance. We did a final round of shots and passed out before we even caught a warning. As I explained, the camping we did was extremely rough. We had a little fire pit, the sleeping bags and maybe a couple of chairs and a portable speaker, and absolutely no coverage. No trees, no tarps, no canvas, no tent. There's nothing to use as a shelter. This is bush camping and the only place we could cut loose and catch a buzz. In the middle of the night, all five of us drunk teenagers left the campsite to shelter in caves nearby. The rain woke us up first, torrential as it poured out of the sky and into our sleeping bags. The panic was overwhelming, and soon the lightning and thunder had us all worked up and frothing at the mouth. It's scary to be caught out in extreme unexpected weather. There's literally nowhere to go. I don't know why, but it reminded me of drowning or something, just being totally out of control of the situation breathless and trying to escape. The caves sit up high, overlooking a large fork in the Hawkesbury River. We had a rough idea of where they were, but the storm had us completely disoriented. A lightning flash would illuminate the ridgeline and have us all shuffling. Another flash, and we'd look up to see how somehow we ran in the wrong direction. It was like a f***ed up game of cat and mouse, except this game felt fatal. We made it though, Despite the whole planet working against us, the dirt turned to mud beneath us, sucking off our shoes and socks. The rocks gave way at every turn and let us fall on our asses. We didn't care. We scrambled up the face of the hill and found our way into the mouth of the system. We laid there in a pile for a while, catching our breath. We'd all flinch every time the lightning flashed or thunder barked. Soaked from the rain and cold, we eventually started to laugh, harder than we ever have. All of it was terrifying just a few seconds ago, and now it didn't matter. We were still pretty drunk, it turned out. A couple of us set to digging a fire pit. We had a couple of lighters amongst us, and there was random scrub brush along the cave floor. We took turns scraping the dry, cracked earth with stones and fingertips, careful not to fold them back on the rogue rocks in the soil. We got maybe five inches down when we discovered something, something more than bones. Human remains. Fresh enough to recognize as body parts, hair, skin, the whole thing. Now we are really stuck and we can't leave the cave because of the aggression of the storm outside and we're trapped with a dead body in a shallow grave. Half of us cracked up right there and started crying, speechless at the sight. Did someone really dump a body out here? Is there some kind of predator deeper within this cave, sleeping off its last meal? We huddled together and tried to be quiet, but it was a rapidly devolving situation. All we wanted was for dawn to break. Then we could evaluate what was going on a bit better, come up with some sort of plan. 
We sat by the mouth of the cave, asked to not be so close to the corpse that shared the cave with us. The storm broke long before the sun came up. We broke for home in a second, running at full sprint right past our camp into the bush and back into our neighborhood. It took us an hour to make the trip, stumbling, bruising our shins and cutting our feet open. We told our parents what happened, who promptly called the police. They conducted an investigation in the morning and discovered those remains. They belonged to an aboriginal burial site and were apparently still in use by various outlying villages. We didn't realize just how far outside of town we were out there. And we never went back there after, especially after we spent the night with the dead. I was walking a section of the Appalachian Trail with a couple of buddies when we happened across a bundle of sticks. The sticks were made into a figure, kind of similar to the ones from the Blair Witch Project. It was obviously placed there by someone, as it was dead center in the middle of the trail, leaning up against a rock. I thought it was cool, so I grabbed it and put it inside my backpack. Lots of people leave weird stuff on hiking trails, particularly in the Appalachian. Everyone knows another hiker is just a week, a day, an hour, or even just 10 minutes behind you. Not everyone likes it, but some of us leave little trinkets and gifts for whoever is following in our footsteps. Sometimes it's food or beer. Other times it's a blanket or a handcrafted item, like that stick bundle. The figure was cool, and I didn't think twice about grabbing it. The work that it took to intertwine everything was incredibly intricate. I wanted to try to replicate it later on, on a day when I had more time to kill. It was beautiful and eye-catching. The other guys thought it was weird. Like I said, it was reminiscent of the Blair Witch, but the movie was a couple years old at this point, and the novelty of it being supposedly true had definitely worn off. Anyway, we finished the hike and set up for the night in our camping spot. We were all pretty wiped out from the long day, so after dinner, we retired to our respective tents and conked out for the night. These were distant days where we were trying to get the miles behind us. The next morning, I was the first one awake, so I got up to make the coffee. And what did I find? An identical bundle of sticks to the one that we'd found, sitting atop the pile of charred wood from the previous night's fire. And when I say identical, I mean uncanny. Tit or tat, it was the exact same handiwork, the twists, the knots, all the same. First thing I did was check my pack, and sure enough, the one that I'd picked up was still there. Each of my friends swore they didn't put it there, and I obviously said the same. It was weird, because we were all adamant about not putting it there, but I could never be sure that one of them wasn't messing with the other one of us. The thing that messes with me is the bundle that I found in the morning was almost an exact replica of the one that we found on the trail earlier. I find it hard to believe that not one of the other guys could have made such a close replica without being able to model it after the one in my pack. And it's not like either would have placed the one on the trail beforehand for us to stumble upon, as it was far in the middle of nowhere. It also would have been hard for anyone to just find us. We didn't camp along the trail, weary of passing hikers and strangers. All kinds of undesirables hike and loiter along the Appalachian Trail, the low-key hot spot for some of the weirdest people you could ever meet. It's not like it's every other person or something, but when you encounter an odd person out there, you just know it almost immediately. We camped isolated, almost hidden, for this exact reason. I want to believe one of them pulled a prank on the other, because the alternative scares the shit out of me. I was hiking across Newfoundland, following an old railway that was long ago disassembled and turned into a giant trail, sleeping wherever I found myself at night. This wasn't really recreational at the time. I was in and out of drug use, homelessness, and general living on the fringes of society. Being in town or even near people was a point of stress for me. When I wanted to use drugs, I preferred to be alone with no chance of any kind of interaction. It dissolved any guilt or wrongdoing that I felt and allowed me to really lean into the highs and lows that I wanted to feel. So this particular hike was a drug-using tour. I carried a small pack of items that would keep me on the road, 
Extra clothes, some water, pocket knife, lighter. Real basic supplies. I kept a tarp and a rope to fix a shelter. At this point, town and any sign of people is a good two days behind me. I followed the rusted railway deep through the wilderness until I could no longer recognize any geography. I'd get high and just keep walking and exploring until I wanted to get high again. One day I ran into a small cottage town, except everything was abandoned. Trailers falling apart, bus conversions burn out, small cabins all shuttered up. It was creepy but interesting at the same time. The urban decay was like nothing I'd ever seen, especially being so rural. Who used to live here and why did they have to leave? I felt like I discovered a forgotten mystery. The sun was waning, so I decided to set up camp in a mostly empty lot that had an abandoned truck slowly falling into a ravine that was near it. The ravine itself was full of all kinds of random debris, appliances, bags of clothes, scrap metal. Everything was eerie and just out of place. You add my drug-addled brain to the mix and I really couldn't make sense of any of it. I pondered the place while I cooked up some food and then crawled into my sleeping bag. I wake up sometime in the night. I hear footsteps outside my camp. At first I just think it's an animal, but the steps sound like someone walking, a human. The openness of my tarp set up really let me hear every footfall as it happened. The steps got closer and go around my position. I slowly and quietly pull out my knife. He tries to get me. My plan is to stab first and ask questions later. Anyone trying to get into my camp in the middle of nowhere is looking to do some kind of harm. My heart is racing at this point, but I'm trying to stay quiet. There's no phone, nowhere to run, no other options of any kind. Either he's going to walk away or one of us is going to die out here. The footsteps stop somewhere outside of camp. I assume he came up quicker on me than expected, saw the outline of my belongings in the trees. For a split second, we can hear each other breathing. That's it. Like every other backpacker's worst fear. For me, it's doubled. It's a crazed killer, some forest weirdo. Or is it the police, coming to investigate a squatter near an abandoned village? I had it in my head. They'd find all my drugs and paraphernalia, lock me up before sunrise. I honestly don't know which outcome was worse. Luckily, the steps start moving away from the tarp until I can no longer hear them. I wait a bit to see if they come back, but I don't hear anything. I slowly get out of my tarp. Still don't see anything. Without turning on my flashlight, I quickly take down everything, stuff it inside my bag. After that, I just started walking down the trails to get the hell out of there. I walked until daytime. I came across a road and flagged down a truck. That guy was nice, drove me to town where I got a hotel. The creepy thing, when I think back to it, was that whoever was likely watching me walked into town from one of those abandoned structures. I'm guessing a squatter. I'd like to think that he was just curious, but I'm glad I didn't stay and wait to see if he'd be back. This definitely falls into the strangest category. While solo pitching for a long weekend in the Pacific Northwest, the one day was in the rare part of the trail that is closer to civilization. So there was a higher chance of other hikers and campers being around. I saw one or two people, but that was mostly from afar. It was nightfall soon, getting cold, and I was getting deeper into the woods. I knew the odds of seeing someone else was highly unlikely. I was hiking around the small pond and was going to set up camp nearby when I heard this shuffling noise behind a small rock wall type of thing. It was like an outcrop of boulders that laid in a fault line. It was a repetitive noise that got louder and then quieter, but never stopped at all. Basically, if you're a regular hiker, you know a noise that does not fit in the woods when you hear it. I took out my two knives that I carry when hiking and slowly walked around the boulder, honestly not knowing what I'd see. This is part of the deal out there though. It's why I carry blades with me through the brush. There are animals, weirdos, and any number of unknown factors that might come at you. You gotta be prepared for anything, and being prepped sometimes means taking it head on. What I did not expect, and was very shocked to see, 
was a very attractive couple in their 20s, having very aggressive but happy doggy style sex on a blanket. Obviously, they were as shocked as I was to see one another. They freaked and yelled, as did I, and as they covered their bodies and their clothes in a panic, I awkwardly apologized, picked up all my gear, and then just sort of jogged off into the woods, passing their tent that they pitched along the way. I completely missed their equipment. It was erected on the other side of the slope of the hill, the one I hadn't come up on. They were at ease being so far into the wilderness, but they didn't account for me to go bushwhacking in their same tracks. I backtracked for about a half a mile before I figured I was in the clear. It's not like they were going to chase me down. I bet I looked like a real psycho coming around that boulder, wide-eyed and wielding a pair of daggers. I reset my campsite and laughed myself to sleep that night. I wonder if that couple is still together, and if they tell that story when they get drunk at parties, like sometimes I do. I was camping in Northern California, like at the very tippy top of California, deep in the woods at a reservoir. This place could be big for recreation in the right time of year. But this was fall and during the middle of the week, so I found myself completely alone out there. I had my truck back there off the road a good four or five miles. I had to go poop really bad in the morning before the sun was up, and there's no bathrooms. So I walked down the trail and found this little spot, isolated away from the trail, next to this blackberry bush, and an outcropping of water from the reservoir. As I stated, there was no other camps around, no cars. I can't even hear an engine revving in the area. I'm alone as alone can be. I heard some crashing in the tree line. As it just started to become light outside, the hell just stumbled into my secret area. I realize I don't know if it's hunting season in this area. I'm hidden in the brush. I'd heard a lot of people accidentally shot deep in the wilderness areas during the hunting seasons. I peeked over the blackberry bush, and not 40 feet from me, a huge bear, easily 500 pounds. I tried to sneak away, but as I was stepping backwards, I kid you not, I stepped onto a twig that snapped. My pants are halfway down my legs, my rear end is a mess, and now I'm on the radar of an apex predator. Sneaking isn't an option, and running is a death sentence. This bear and I instantly both turn our heads towards one another, lock eyes. We both know what's going on. I'm scared and the bear isn't. The bear is curious, hungry, maybe agitated. The way it crashed into the clearing, it sounded like it. Me? I'm half naked, covered in sweat. I hear it huff on the other side of the bush. It's deciding how to go about securing breakfast. I attempted to make myself look big and make noise. Bear didn't budge. In fact, he started to walk towards me now. This wasn't good because it was the only option I was comfortable with. Everyone has heard that you just make yourself big and loud to go away. Nope. They don't go away. They come and see what you're made of. Many things were racing through my mind. The number one being, there's no way I'm curling up into a ball and allowing this monstrously giant bear to mess with me. I crouched down as low as I could behind the blackberry bush, so he couldn't see me. I start running as fast as I could while crouched and squatting down. This was it, the last avenue. Scaring it didn't work, so flight was the last choice. You have to remember that I was alone out there, the only camper around the reservoir. Even if I screamed, no one would be coming to bail me out. My thought process was that if he couldn't see me run, maybe he wouldn't chase me if I was already kind of far away before he actually saw me running over that blackberry bush. It worked. He pursued around the bush for maybe 20 feet, decided it wasn't worth it, and allowed my escape. The bear had gotten so close that I could actually smell him could see the slobber dripping from its mouth. Honestly, I thought I was going to be breakfast for this bear, and that would be the end of me. I got back to camp, cleaned up, and waited for my visitor to come barreling out of the trees. He never did, and I stayed on high alert for the rest of that trip. Me and a group of 20 others were hiking in a two-person line, hip-to-hip -hip with a partner. We were walking through very thick woods at around 1am. 
Certain members were designated to carry a flashlight. Others on each end of the line carried radios for quick contact. This was a training exercise for a wilderness survival program. So we were in good spirits, with a high energy despite the late hour. Our young team was very prepared to complete the overnight training. We managed to find a muddy road which we continued to walk over for miles before going back into the woods. We practiced direction changes, quick marches, silent stalking, team stops, and terrain sprints. While walking on that muddy road again, I held a conversation with one of my friends that was right in front of me. We were no longer marching in ordered pairs, more of a free walk as we navigated the woods. After a while of talking, I noticed that my group was further ahead of me than they were before, so I picked up the pace. I must have gotten distracted and slowly fallen behind with my buddy. As I got closer, I noticed something odd. The friend that I was talking to was already with the rest of my group. I turned back and saw that I was alone. No sign of my friend or anyone along the road. Who the hell was I talking to? I looked back again to make sure the radio man wasn't slinking behind too, and perhaps I was overhearing a conversation, mistaking it for my own. No radio man, nothing. I went to my friend and asked him how to get back so quickly. He turned and looked at me and said, I was wondering where you were, you disappeared for a good five minutes. Let's just say I didn't feel alright after hearing those words. I know for a fact that I was speaking to him earlier, and if not him, then someone exactly the same with all the same gear. Luckily nothing happened after that, but I was pretty shook for the rest of that hiking night. This all happened in Poland when I was a teenager many many years ago. There's no phones or any kind of social media back then. I've wondered about that experience ever since it happened. I've never had it happen yet, but I always worry about stumbling across a pot grow. I found abandoned ones, never an active one, thankfully. I live in the southwest, where this isn't really a far-fetched notion. People find these things all the time, at least they did 10 years ago. Cartel affiliates, and even just regular outlaw citizens, go deep in the wilderness and set up a perimeter, then proceed to fill the acreage with row after row of pot growth. They aren't necessarily bad people, but this was a felony, and so required the security of such. It wasn't uncommon to be chased out of these grow operations by heavily armed gunmen. All these stories conjured a paranoia for me, as my hobby took me deep into the reaches of the wilderness. I'd often be alone, only lightly armed with zero contact to the outside world. One time, I found a completely empty gallon milk jug, sitting on a rock in the middle of a creek, an inch above the water line with some water splashed on the surrounding rocks like somebody had just walked into the middle of the creek. The rocks were in a shallow spot, but there were two deep pools on either side, so they would have been in the water, at least up to their hips, to get away from the creek. I just stood there and kind of took in the details for a while. The hell did I just walk upon? I was miles from any kind of trailhead or camping area, rough and tumble hiking into a pretty isolated canyon. It wasn't the strangest thing for somebody to come upon, but for them to take off, the second they hear me, I just didn't get it. They'd have to be up to something to run, right? It was really creepy because there was no sign of anyone around. The creek had flooded the night before. That little empty jug would have been beat to hell and placed either much higher along the creek or absolutely buried in the floating refuse. The jug was clean, intact, unscuffed, and essentially brand new. It even had an expiration date that hadn't yet come to pass. Someone had just set this jug down when I came around the bend. There's no tracks on the bank, and it would have been close to impossible for anyone else to have been in that narrow canyon without me being aware of them. I'd have seen their tracks or even seen them. No explanation for it other than somebody had heard me coming and scampered down the middle of the creek to avoid leaving tracks before climbing out somewhere where the bank was rocky and then hiding from me after that. As for why, who knows? Mental illness or criminal activity? I did leave that area in a hurry, though. In that same area years later on, on another trip, somebody lit my campsite up from directly above with a high-powered spotlight in the middle of the night. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. 
complete illumination, silent, totally disarming. You don't know vulnerability until some unseen force above you lights up your entire world just to take a look at you. There is nobody around, no aircraft overhead, no trees big enough to hide a person, nothing, absolute dead silence. I would have heard branches crackling if there was anybody in the trees above me or anywhere around me. The light didn't come from the branches though, it came from well above them. Only later did someone suggest to me that it might have been grow op related. Maybe the growers upgraded their security to include drones, which would be a genius move on their part. It would also make sense for the government agencies to employ drones while searching for these grow ops. It was a military buddy of mine who suggested the theory to me. He explained that he'd seen drones due to terrorists exactly what had happened to me. Just to light up their camps, make them freeze while fire teams moved into position. I've mistaken elk for bears in the middle of the night a few times. Never had a bear in my camp, but I've had more elk than a few times. It's always good for some heart racing panic until you get a positive ID on the large critter bumping around camp. It definitely still doesn't even compare to what it felt like when that light hit me. I didn't know where to post this, but I guess this is a good place as any. I've been a long lurker of the horror community and finally decided to share one of my stories that I've tried to block out of my mind. I have posted pictures that I took during that day. And before you ask, no, I do not have the camera or the drive that the pictures were on. I tried looking through the metadata of the pictures and videos that I captured, but the time frame that we hiked and the timestamp on the images are way off. With that being said, I'm almost certain that I have a picture that was taken right at the time of the event, but again I don't know which one it is. Now on to my story. The following took place on July 19th, 2011. I'll give you a little background. Every summer since I was seven, I would go out to California to visit my dad. He would take me up and down the state, visiting all the cool places a kid wanted to go to. As I got older, he started to take me to national parks like Yellowstone, Redwoods, and Yosemite. During this year in particular, he wanted to go back to Yosemite and rent one of those tents you see in a village campsite. I was really excited since the last time we were there, we stayed in a hotel that was nearly two hours outside of the park. He also mentioned we should hit the park's infamous mist trail that goes up Vernal Falls again since. Well, last time, I had difficulty hiking up it since my feet were killing me. He even hinted that he wanted to go down the John Muir Trail that was on top of the falls. Now John Muir, for those of you that don't know, he's a bit of a California legend. He sought out to preserve some of the wilderness lands in the United States. His most notable accomplishment was establishing Yosemite as a national park in 1890. But even after his death, the man had a hospital and a middle school named after him. The last bit of information that I want to point out here was during that year, Yosemite set a record of its waterfalls being three times more powerful than ever before, due to the amount of snow and rain it had received during the winter and springtime. I think it was even featured on the nightly news when Brian Williams was on there at the time. On the morning of the hike, both my dad and I woke up with excitement. The two of us had trained for this day, and me being on the cross-country team for my school, and him working out at the gym, we were more than ready to take on this amazing trail. We packed up our backpacks put on our boots, and drove my dad's SUV to the trailhead parking spot. When we got there, it was around 8.30, and the parking lot was already full. I guess there were a lot of people eager to see this once-in-a-lifetime moment. We had to park all the way over where the Curry Village was. This will be important for later. After a mile and a half, we reached the trailhead. The first part of the mist trail is paved, and it has some steep hill inclines, nothing too extreme. After you reach the end of the paved trail, you go across the footbridge over the stream that's at the bottom of the falls. However, that little stream is full-blown Rapid River. Now keep in mind, the park at the time had a very limited amount of signs and guardrails around the water areas, so it wasn't uncommon to see people wander up the trail just to be by the stream to sunbathe or dip their feet in. Kids would also want to go in and splash each other like they were at a water park. 
My dad and I were also guilty of going off the trails to take pictures and such. Some of my pictures that I provided for you guys shows just how easy it was to be by the water. As for the park rangers, some of them really didn't mind it at the time. In fact, it was kind of nice having people explore the park, just as long as they were cautious and used good judgment. I haven't been back to Yosemite since this event. I don't know how strict they are with this trail. I also forgot to mention this earlier, but the trail isn't for everybody. Once you pass the footbridge, it's all uphill, and you have to climb up these stone steps. Some of the steps have eroded or washed away over the years, which made it extra difficult to climb in certain areas, especially when it got to be really narrow. You also have to combat the mist from the falls and not lose your footing. Otherwise, you might fall over the edge and into the water. After a short break, my dad and I started to head up Vernal Falls. And like I mentioned earlier, the mist from the falls was very intense but it was rewarding in a way. When we got to the top, it was almost noon. We were ready to tear open our lunches, but before we did that, we went over to the John Muir trailhead while taking some along the way. The trail wasn't too long, but if we wanted to get back to the parking lot, we would have to take another trail which took way longer than the mist trail. We came to a conclusion that we would think about it during lunch since our hunger was just now overwhelming. That's when my dad asked me if we should eat by the falls or find a quieter place. To this day, I still don't know what made me blurt out that we should find a quieter spot, away from the falls, and other noisy tourists. My dad agreed. We made our way up to the river to the point that it becomes a small creek, and then sat down at a picnic area. There was no one in sight. All that we could hear was the water flowing in the streams and the birds chirping. As we were finishing up, we saw a bunch of people coming from every direction and they weren't walking or running. It was as if they were in a rush to get somewhere, but didn't know where to go. We didn't think anything of it, decided to head over to the stream before we went back to the falls. Now to get to the stream, you had to walk over a bunch of rocks that were fun to climb and jump over. We approached one, jumped over the gap. My dad went first making it look easy, while I on the other hand had to get a running head start. As I made my way over the gap, I heard something hiss and sort of jump up in my leg. Upon landing, I quickly turned around to see a coiled up rattlesnake in the gap with his eyes fixed on me. Luckily for me, he didn't bite me. I was a safe distance away. I called out for my dad, who was like Indiana Jones when it comes to snakes. I pointed it out, and when he saw it, his face turned pale white. I laughed as he backed away in fear, and as he did that, Another hiker was making their way right for the gap. I immediately told him to go around, and he had a confused expression on his face. Then once he came around to our side, he saw that rattlesnake. He took out his phone to take pictures and videos. At this point, my dad had definitely had enough of that snake and made his way to the stream, which I followed him, hoping that guy wouldn't get bit. The creek was pretty shallow, and was hard to believe that it turned into this roaring waterfall. I stayed at the edge of the creek to soak my bandana in the cold while my dad went a little further and bent down to do the same. Then all of a sudden, this guy came out of nowhere and started talking to my dad in a frantic voice. He said something along the lines of, Sir, you're not allowed to be in there. Please get out of the water. Like I mentioned earlier, it wasn't uncommon to see people by the water, especially near a small stream like this one. It was very odd though, because this guy wasn't a park ranger, nor was he dressed for hiking. My dad slowly got up and said to the guy, uh, We're just soaking our sweatbands before we head back down. Everything is fine. The man grew more concerned. Sir, please, you need to get out of the water now. It's very dangerous. I just saw three people die from where you're standing. Then the man turned to me and said, Son, if you value your father's life, you have to get him out of there. I'm completely speechless at this point. My dad is ignoring this man's pleas, but before either one of us could say or do anything, the man runs off trying to warn other tourists that were getting close to the water. After he was out of sight, my dad got out and we grabbed our backpacks and headed towards the falls. As we were walking, I asked my dad what that guy meant when he said that he saw three people die just where we were standing in that small stream. He looked at me confused as well, but reassured me that maybe they fell and hurt themselves or something. That confused me 
even more. The stream wasn't as powerful as the fall, so how could someone lose their footing and die? The thought didn't last long, because I was then distracted by the crowd of people that were gathering around the area, where I'd spotted that rattlesnake. We were trying to find a park ranger so that no one would get hurt, but for some reason, there wasn't one in sight. We kept walking till we finally made it to the falls, and at that point, we were completely exhausted from that hike up. So we decided to go back down the mist trail. When we got to the trailhead, there was a large crowd of people blocking the trail. Impatiently, we made our way through the group of people and confused hikers. And that's when we saw the caution tape all along the trail itself. There must have been 15 park rangers scouting the area, telling hikers coming up off the trail to turn back immediately. Someone asked one of the rangers why they were closing it off, and almost in a calm and professional tone, the ranger said this, Oh, everything is alright, there's just a dead animal that was found on the trail, and the smell is really unbearable. We're trying to remove it, but for now, the mist trail is closed. Everyone here will have to take the John Muir trail to get back down. I immediately knew something was off. There was way too much caution tape for just one dead animal, and why were they taping off the edges that are near the falls? Also, the two park rangers that were on the trail weren't looking on the trail itself. They were looking down into the water. Then I heard on the static of one of their radios. All I could make out was something about missing hikers. The John Muir Trail turned out to be a pretty nice detour. That is, until we hit the Paranorma Trail. It was caked with horse droppings and the smell was as bad as you can imagine. It went on for 10 miles. We caught up with some of the other hikers along the way. We're all speculating on what actually happened. One said that it was a bear that died. The rangers had to get a dump truck to haul it away. Another said it was a moose or a deer. It's funny what people come up with in these types of situations, but all of them would end up being wrong. Two hours later, we all finally get to the bottom of the trail. And my legs feel like jelly at this point. And we still needed to get back to the parking lot. On the way back there, we spotted another park ranger standing guard at the mist trailhead. Curiosity got the better of my dad. He went over to the ranger and asked what actually happened. The ranger, knowing that my dad wasn't buying the whole dead animal story, let out a sigh and with a hesitant expression on his face, he said, There's these three hikers. They were part of this church group. They all decided to go over the railings that were near the top of the falls to take some pictures. The first victim went in the water, eventually lost their footing and fell. It was only a matter of time for the current to take him down the waterfall. And two more hikers from that group went in and tried to save him. They also lost their footing was overtaken by the current. It was at this point, people who were all witnessing this discouraged others from jumping in unless they wanted to have the same thing happen to them. The drop didn't kill them instantly and the rocks below would have torn them apart. The trail was closed shortly after in fear of one of their bodies being on it. I sat there mortified. If we had decided to eat our lunch over there, we would have been one of the many dozens of people that witnessed this horrible event. Do nothing but stand there and watch as three people fell to their fate. What that ranger told us still haunts me to this day. Due to the falls and rapids being this powerful, we cannot recover the bodies until it dies down in October or even November. My heart sunk into my chest, thinking about the friends and family members of the victims. It's going to be a while for them to be there until recovery. We got back into our car with our legs aching from that 12 mile hike and for the rest of the way back it was completely silent i never brought it up to my dad again and i still think about that man telling my dad to get out i don't know what i would have done if my dad was one of those victims it just goes to show you that no picture is worth risking your own life i'll link some articles of this event you can also do some research of your own and one of the articles i've listed it's a follow-up on the bodies being recovered. I'll summarize it here in case you don't want to read it. David Hormiz, 22 years old, was the first to be discovered a month after the incident. He was pinned against a boulder 250 feet downstream. Nino Zacub, age 27, was found on November 29th, trapped under towering boulders that weren't visible until the river level was at its lowest. Then the following Saturday, Ramina Badel, 21 years old was found. The three were from the close-knit community of Central Valley Christians from the Middle East. 
My heart goes out to the friends and families of those victims. May they rest in peace. Thank you for reading my post. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. What's going on everybody? Um, I had every intention of uploading this last night, but I... I got through the very the second to last story, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to find one more story and make it an hour long. Um, I like Deep Woods episodes, and uh, the stories within this one were really good, too. So but, and I said, screw it. I'm going to find one more. And uh, by the time it was like 9 p.m., I'm like, there's no point in releasing it tonight, so I'm just going to wait. Um, so here we are. Recorded it this morning. I'll have it out tonight uh, for your ear holes. You can punch it in there and enjoy that. Um... Also, I've complained before about, you know, how limited my time is when it comes to recording and doing stuff right now. So as you can hear right now, you can probably hear my daughter squealing in the background because she was asleep two minutes ago. And now here we are. So I'm going to make this one short and sweet. Um, new episode or next episode will be out on Friday. Uh, that's the plan. I'm not sure if I'm going to do the Colts episode or if I'm going to do the other topic yet. I have yet to figure it out. So when I do, you'll know because you'll see it and enjoy it and live it and love it, laugh it, live, love, laugh, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I really have anything else. Um, yeah, outside of I hope you enjoy this episode and hope you have a great, fantastic week. Alrighty. Okay there, don't you know? Yeah, okay there. Yeah, okay, okay. Oh. All my Canadian listeners, I hope you have a big pile of flapjacks today. Put some maple syrup on there, okay? Make a good trip to Tim Hortons. Do all that fun stuff, okay? I sure do appreciate eating and every one of you, okay? All right, I love y'all. Gotta go take care of a four-month-old. Cheers. <laughs>